Uh, Quentin asked me to uh, send him an abstract from, from a few days ago, so I wrote a two-page abstract. I don't know whether uh, this actually will characterize. So let's read through them at any rate. This lecture will draw upon three areas in the title of the summer school, language, cognition, and neuroscience, with orientation to an East Asian perspective. Uh, I was hoping to be able to say something about exotones and sonograms, but it depends on time. Since it's the first lecture in the summer school, Part one will provide some basic introduction to the central concepts in all three areas, including brief historical backgrounds for these concepts. Hopefully this part will give all the students of the summer school some common ground for participating in later activities. The second part, two parts, We'll discuss the development of cognition and language across the lifespan, beginning with fetal life. With the rapid growth of the brain after birth, supporting an ever increasing variety of perceptual, cognitive, and motor activities, also language is acquired before the body undergoes major changes associated with puberty. Neural anatomical decline starts after the reproductive years and accelerates typically after 60 years of age. As the body gradually atrophies, especially the brain, Many cognitive and linguistic functions may become compromised by age-related pathologies. I'll be concerned with both normal and abnormal developments in this two-part overview, and wherever appropriate, I will connect my remarks to the forthcoming activities of the summer school, and this PDF will be made available immediately after the lecture. I'm not sure I'll stay very close to this abstract that I sent Quentin. We'll see how it goes. Let me begin by giving you a little quiz. Many of you will recognize him, right? That's Andy Murray, one of the great tennis stars. And then there's a chimpanzee, a gorilla. All three are primates. Question is, which two primates are the closest relatives? Okay. If you ask this of the man on the street, it will happen. She will say, oh, oh, of course these two may look at them. The looks are deceiving. We'll see that actually these two primates are the closest relatives. What is the evidence for such a incredible claim? Well, to begin with, they're fossils. People have been digging up fossils for several centuries now. And if you look at the fossil of a man, a fossil of a chimpanzee, a fossil of a gorilla, and so on, the resemblances are obvious, and it's also obvious that, that these two share many more similarities. In fact, Charles Darwin 
speculated on his question. And his very good friend, Thomas Huxley, wrote a book called Man's Condition in Nature, in which right in the front of the book, he gave a series of skeletal remains of these, showing very clearly the relation between humanity and us. Well, fossils are obviously important, but there's another discipline that contributes vital information to this question of phylogeny. I hope everybody knows the word phylogeny as opposed to ontogeny. Phylogeny has to do with the evolution of species. So we could talk about the phylogeny of primates. In the other word, ontogeny, as opposed to phylogeny, refers to the evolutionary trajectory of single individuals. So on the phylogeny of apes, of primates, the other new important source of information is in the genes. If we look at the genes of uh, these three right, primates, we'll see that there are all sorts of similarities. Over 90% similarities in the DNA between humans and the chimpanzee. In a way, this is not surprising because life has been on this planet for billions of years. And for most of these billions of years, the chimpanzee and us share the same biological development. So it's not surprising. We share a tremendous amount of genes. Fossils, genes. But recently, within the last 20 years or so, Another powerful body of evidence came to help us solve this question. Geneticists have become so clever that they're able to take fossils and extract genes from these fossils. So rather than modern DNA, we also have ancient DNA. I remember I was at, at Berkeley 20 some years ago, a colleague of mine, Adam Wilson. He was a very eminent uh, biologist, and he gave a faculty lecture speculating that one day we'll be able to take genes from fossils. And he exemplified his speculation by taking an extinct animal, a kind of a horse, and extract and fossil from it. A lot of progress has been made in ancient DNA, and it's primarily this man. He has a Finnish name, Peru, but he's actually the most of his work in the Max Planck Institute in Germany. Max Institute of Evolutionary Anthropology. And in his book, his first name is Fonte, holding up the head of the Neanderthal. There are no Neanderthals left. They died out 30,000, 40,000 years ago. And yet, Fonte was able to extract DNA from Neanderthals and show that many, many millennia ago, our own ancestors mated at sex with him because we carry some of their genes. And uh, so for the past, this book was published in 2014, but for the past decade, ancient DNA has been marching along very, very 
rapidly, making good progress. And this geneticist at Harvard University, David Reich, recently, this last year, put out a very good book summarizing the findings of ancient DNA and modern DNA in order to answer the question who we are and how we find it. One of the things that uh, Svante did in Leipzig was to train a lot of young people because scholarship depends on the transmission of knowledge from generation to generation. And having young scientists come up is a vital aspect for science to progress. One of the people that Svante trained is Fu Xiaomei, now in Beijing at the Academy of Sciences. And back in 2013, Xiaomei wrote a paper with Han, with Swante and a few other people, on the fossils discovered around Beijing, this place called Jianyuan. This was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in America and uh, discussed in several later papers, including in current biology and trends in genetics. These other places are also places where ancient DNA has been, has, has been extracted. So in this paper, in this 2013 paper, Charmé makes this remark. As we extract the DNA from a 40,000 year old anatomically modern human, okay? this sometimes is abbreviated as AMH, anatomically modern human. This means their proportions are very much like us. And if Chen Man walked in through that door, we would not be, would be surprised. On the other hand, if Beijing Ren walked in. He goes back almost a million years. We could scare He looked so different. The 40 year old anatomical model came from Tianyuan. And uh, the DNA typically comes from two sources. One is called the mitochondrial DNA. This is found in the cells but outside the nucleus, there are all sorts of little proteins called mitochondria, each with its very small complement of genes. The important thing to know about mitochondria DNA is that it's transmitted maternally, mother to daughter, mother to daughter, all the way down. So if you want to find out the history of women, you concentrate on mitochondrial DNA. The other source of DNA, the major source of DNA, is in the nucleus of the cell itself. And within the nucleus of the human cell, there are little strands which are intertwined, and we have 23 such pairs. Each such strand is called a chromosome. So chromosome 21 is the 21st pair of these 23 pairs. So Chame extracted DNA from this man from Tianyuan, mostly from mitochondrial DNA and from chromosome 21, and is able to come to very interesting conclusions. Does the Tianyuan Tianyuan derive from a population that was ancestral to many present day patients? He was one of our ancestors. As well as to Native Americans. We know that Native Americans went to Native America from Asia. 
but this was after Tiananmen's time. Before Tiananmen's time, uh, the Asians and the Europeans split. So that lineage goes further back than Kutupan. This gives you a flavor of the type of knowledge that we now have about our own distant past. I mentioned Neanderthal, who went extinct 30,000 years ago. Near where the Neanderthal was discovered in a cave on the border of Mongolia and Russia, there's a cave called the Denisovan Cave. He discovered some fossils there and found yet another species related to humans. So in addition to the Anatol men, we also have Denisovan men. And this is a much later discovery than the Anatol. A lot of work has been done. And now we know that the Anatol, uh, Denisovans started up, up north, migrated southward, went through Tibet and gave some of its genes to Tibetans. So they intermarried with Tibetans. And later on, wound up in Southeast Asia, New Guinea. That's where most of the Denisovan genes are found. And it's interesting that they left these genes in Tibet because these are the genes that allow Tibet, Tibetans to make very, very intensive use of the oxygen that they breathe in, giving them the possibility of living at such high altitudes. Most of us will not last long at 6,000 meters, 8,000 meters. The Tibetans, Ruth and Southern genes, have this ability. So even 20, 30, 40,000 years ago, and this opens Neanderthal, Homo sapiens, that's not happy mixing. So it's not surprising that now we are the products of millennia and millennia of genetic mixing. There is no such thing as a pure race. Genes are being exchanged all the time. When people migrate, they leave. They come into contact. When they come into contact, two things get exchanged. Language and genes. So we talk about Chinese speaking Han Yu. What is Han? There is no pure Han. There is only a mixed bag where all sorts of tribal people over the thousands of years, people mixing, people integrating, people dividing, and merging again. A good way to see this is from this immunological study done by Zhao and Chao was working in Shanghai, and he was from the American Red Cross. They took blood from almost 10,000 Chinese at 74 different regions. Xinjiang, Hainan, Zhejiang, Yunnan, Sichuan, all over. And these are the 74 regions at which they took blood samples in order to examine the genetic relationship. So if you put these 74 populations together and construct a family tree, here is the root, and after this group, the two major clusters. What are the clusters uh, separated from? The two great river valleys. 
from 1 to 42, these are all population living along Yellow River and regions nearby. 43 to 74, Hamjiang. The geography plays an extremely important role. If you stand this tree on its head, you'll find that 19 and 20, 19 and 20, where are they? 19 and 20. One of them is Fuei, the other one is Han. The Han in that area, the, the Han in area 20 is genetically closest to the Hui in every country than it is to the other hands further away. So we have to say in Chinese, Yuan Qin Guru Jin Li. This applies genetically. And uh, in the map, there's the here is the Changjiang, and you can see the distribution of the 74 sites. And this separation here at the root corresponds to a separation along latitude number 30, which runs from Lhasa to Shanghai, right along the Changjiang. Linguists have long noted that geography plays a very important role in culture, including, of course, language. One of the first group linguists that talked about this was a man called Schmidt, Johannes Schmidt. And in 1872, he talked about the formation of the Indo-European speech we say Indo-European, but early it was actually called Indo-Germanic. It's the same family. Okay. And uh, Indo-European or Indo-Germanic includes these, among others, these families, Celtic, which is Irish, Scottish, Italian, which is uh, Italian, Sardinian. Greek, Germanic, including English, also Slavic, Indo-Iranian, Persian, Armenian, Armenian. And as kind of an illustration of this wave theory, Velen theory is the German word for wave theory. We can see a diagram like this. We can see that certain features Celtic shared, shared with Italic, Italic shared with Greek, Italic with German, Indo-Iranian with Chinese, and these are all geographical pages. Geography plays a very important role for understanding genetic makeup and linguistic makeup. A French Geneticist a few years ago called Mari Cook. He wrote about the, uh, some probabilistic schema on the variation of actual population. And uh, shortly after that, a very evident Japanese geneticist called Shimuro Moto turns this idea into a stepping stone model. Population increase or decrease depending on their geographical distance. So if you plot distance, 
against color, against the kinetic ability to the graph sometimes. I had a very good kinetic friend when I was in Berkeley. He was an anchor. His name was Kaladi Sosa. Kaladi Sosa told me about this, and he asked me, if you can do this for people, then we also do it with language. So let's try. So we took 17 islands in the South Pacific, and they called the Micronesian Islands. We measured their distance on the one hand and the degree that they shared their vocabulary on the other. And we wrote this paper for language called Spatial Distance and Lexical Replacement. And the result was quite gratifying. So you have distance, proportion of shared vocabulary, and it's a relatively nice exponential curve. Okay, now let's return to the quiz of three primates. If we look at their uh, genes and fossils and so on, we can construct a family tree. This tree is published in uh, 19, uh, a few years ago by Daniel Lieberman, who is the chairman of anthropology at Harvard University. So according to Lieberman, the last common ancestor of chimps, gorillas, and us was around 9 million years ago. So about 9 million years ago, gorillas went its own way. 6 million years ago, we split from the chimpanzees. About less than 2 million years ago, the chimpanzees again split into two species. One is called the bonobos, the other is called pan, and uh, they're very, very different chimpanzees, very, very different behaviors. One is very aggressive with an alpha male, frequently fighting. The other, the bonobo, is controlled by sheer power among females, and they're much, much more loving. Before we discovered the bonobos, people said, you know, we're just like chimpanzees, and say that they didn't because they're two types of chimpanzees. Some of us are like one type, some of us are like the other type. After the separation from the chimpanzee, a very important step we took was that we stood up. They stood up too, but not in the way that we do. We stood up, we stood up very straight, they stood extremely important event in our journey uh, toward becoming modern. What are the consequences of standing up? The whole body got restructured. But most importantly, we freed our hands. We don't use the hands to pound the ground anymore. We can we develop an opposable thumb for power grasping and dexterity with each hand. Those of you who have taken musical instruments realize how important 
dexterity thing. So all of these extras had, they started making tools. Other animals made tools too. For instance, chimpanzees would break off a twig and poke it into a tree hole to eat termites. My ancestors started making tools in a much greater, sophisticated variety. Stones for pounding, stones for cutting, stones for drilling, all sorts of stuff. And from stones, we made more stones and so on. So that tool making started about two million years ago. We became identified with our genus. We are called Homo sapiens. Our genus is Homo, and Homo is the animal that starts making tools, not like our ancestors. So this is roughly uh, Homo in Chinese is the Shu or the genus, sapiens is the job or the species. So this is a more careful discussion of the issues we we've been discussing. We all belong to the order of biological group of primates, Ling Zhang Lei. And about 35, 40 million years ago, certain monkeys split up. These are the monkeys that we find out in the, in the Americas, especially South America. The monkeys we find in Asia and Africa are called old world monkeys. They stayed with us a little bit longer. And the remaining clay are all apes. No tails. Gibbons have no tail, orangutans have no tail, and these are found in mostly Southeast Asia. The two African apes, the gorilla and the chimpanzee, are the closest to us. They are our closest living relatives. Neanderthals and his were closer, but they are extinct. And this line, this is a study by a geneticist, Eric Allender, and it shows that we and the chimpanzee differ only by 1.2%. This is what I said a little about that. We share such a long span of common evolutionary history, so our genes are largely similar. But the line in this slide that I want people to pay special attention to, very important for the topic of the summer school, is this one, bottom one. Brain volumes in cc, in cubic centimeters. Whereas our brains go from about 1100 to 1700 cc, the chimpanzee's brain is only about one third or one fourth as large. And even though the gorilla is huge compared to us, its brain is that's an app. So what do we do with this huge brain in addition to the dexterous hands? Well, it seems that our life has a different stage. If we take a look at the monkey, okay, it starts out as an infant, becomes a juvenile requiring very little care, then becomes an adult. That's when it starts fighting for territory, fighting for food, and so on, as an individual in the farm. And a monkey lives maybe 25 years. If we look at Chimpanzees, early hominids, 
their lifestyle is not all that different from that of the monk. But with us, after the intensity, before the juvenile, we have a period called childhood. This is unique to our species. During childhood, we have complete care, all the food, all the protection from our kind. And during this period, the brain keeps on going very, very fast, learning the abundant amount of information that has built up in our culture. So this is a device that allows our species, humans, to evolve along two dimensions. First, biological dimension, just like the other half. And then, with the invention of tools, with the accumulation of culture, with a brain that's able to absorb all this, we start on another track called cultural evolution. And cultural evolution outpaces is much, much, much faster than biological. So this is kind of a cartoon, a recap. Six million years ago, we split from the chimps. Three and a half million years ago, we split up. And by that, at that time, we were still not homo. We belonged to a different genus called Australopithecus, only found in Africa. Then when we started making pools, we became homo. And about 150, 200,000 years ago, we developed our own species. We became anatomically modern humans. And of course, with uh, the invention of electronics, computer and so on, less than 100 years ago, cultural evolution really goes at a very, very, very fast pace. So a major player in all this scenario is the brain. As we saw, our brain is many times larger than that of our close relatives. And as early as 2,500 years ago, the ancient Greek scientist, Hippocrates, already knew that the brain is the central player in our lives. All men are to know that from nothing else but from the brain. And joys, delights, laughter, scorn, sorrow, grief, and so on. In these ways, I am of the opinion that the brain exercises the greatest power in the nature. This is the interpreter to us of those things which emanate from the air when it happens to be a sound state. So you think you see with your eyes, but you don't see just with your eyes. Your eyes feed information to the brain, and you see what the brain tells you to solve. Reality is actually much more indirect than most of us feel. And when the brain tells you wrong things, it becomes a slur, like schizophrenics, Split brain, things like that. So when it's not in the sound state, all sorts of neurodegenerative studies, uh, neurodegenerative uh, uh, situations happen, make, make us sick. This quote, by the way, is uh, taken from a book by two linguists, Tami Shibar and Mashivatani. The book is called Syntactic Complexity. A very good point. But even though Hippocrates knew so early that uh, 
that is important. It took thousands of years before anybody was able to do anything for understanding the brain a little bit more. And by far the most important scientist is this man. His name was called, his name was Nassalios. Back in 1543, in the middle of the 16th century, Nassalios was the first to open up the head, take out brains, dissect them, and make very, very detailed drawings. These drawings are still used in textbooks in medical school today, 500 years later. Shows the quality of this work. So, beneath the bone, there are various meninges, various membranes. This idea is peeled back these meninges to expose the actual neurons. So, here is the right hemisphere, here is the left hemisphere. The brain is shaped like a walnut, two hemispheres. This portion that we see on the surface is called the cortex. It's the word meaning bark on the tree. It's the covering. But because the brain grew so large compared to chimpanzees, gorillas, and so on, so large, so fast, and the head is so small, it got crinkled. And as it crinkled, some parts fold out, some parts fold in. The parts that fold out, each one is called a gyrus. Is gyri, and the parts that fold in, each one is called a sulcus, and the plural is sulci. So we see the right hemisphere, lots of gyri, lots of sulci, and lots of blood vessels. The brain is a very, very expensive organ. Of all the blood that the heart pumps out, one fifth of it goes to the brain. And if anything goes wrong with any of these vessels, large vessels, small vessels, the neurons lose their nourishment and you have a stroke. Zhongfeng, what is Zhongfeng? Zhongfeng is the brain being damaged by the lack of blood supply. So in this picture, the right brain and the left brain are separated. And this is just what you would in, in the real world, of course, they're pressed against each other. If you look at a picture like this, you think that maybe the cortex is just one sheet where everything is connected to each other. Fish net. This turned out to be a wrong impression. Actually, if you take a microscope, powerful microscope with a good lens, and look at the, the, the brain, it's not all connected. It's millions and millions of little units. Each one is called a neuron. Neurons and neurons are not connected. They're separated by a little cleft, and this cleft is called a synapse. Very, very tiny, 20 to 40 nanometers wide. And it was to the everlasting credit of this Spanish doctor by the name of Ramon Santiago y Cajal who made this discovery. There he is, sitting in his kitchen with his microscope. This should be uh, 
very um, revealing to us. You don't need huge buildings, large teams, shiny equipment, and so on, to make intellectual breakthroughs. What you should do is think deeply and think bravely. And that's what this Spanish doctor did. He looked into his microscope again and again, making very, very detailed sketches of what he sees. This is a part, very important part of the brain called the hippocampus, and drawn by the heart. So, of course, such great contribution deserved great reward. In 1906, Cajal was awarded the Nobel Prize. And since Cajal, there's been about a dozen or so Nobel Prizes. Explicating further how neurons communicate with each other. Basically, a neuron has a cell body and various processes that stick out. Of the processes that stick out, most are for receiving information, and one for sending out information. The one that's sending out information is called the axon, A-X-O-N. Sometimes it can get very long, such as either sending information down like that, the axon travels happily down. Some are very, very short. Now the axon is coated with a type of material called myelin, comes in sheet form, myelin sheet wrapping around the uh, axon. So how does neuron A talk to neuron B? Neuron A sends out a small electrical signal called the action potential, and it travels down this axon. But because there's myelin wrapped around the axon, it's able to jump, jump, jump across the myelin. This type of conduction is called saltatory, is on the French word, sauter, to jump. Saltatory conduction of the action potential is much, much faster. And once it's at the end, near the synapse, it shares the synapse with dendrites of the next act of the next neuron. So the A neuron deposits various chemicals into the synapse. These chemicals are called neurotransmitters such as acetylcholine, dopamine, serotonin, dozens of different types. And these neurotransmitters are picked up by the dendrite, by the dendrite of the recipient. This is a basic way your brain talks to, to itself. And myelin is extremely important because myelin on one hand helps in the conduction speed on the other hand, it guards against crosstalk against other from um, other neurons. But how many neurons are there? How do you count such a huge number? If I start counting one, two, or three, it will take me centuries. So somehow you have to use some methods to estimate. Previously, people have estimated, and the number that's used quite a lot in the literature is 10 to the 11th of 100 billion, 100 followed by nine zeros. This is only a very rough guess, and people can know which part of the brain has how many and so on. Until recently, 2009, a team of researchers in Brazil, Brazilian researchers, 
actually developed methods of counting the number of neurons, counting the number of cells quite effectively. So here's the brain on which they base the numbers. And this whole brain is on a large side, and the whole brain weighs over 1,500 grams. And since each gram is, takes up approximately one cc, so 1,500 grams is a 15 cc, 1,500 cc uh, brain. And it has uh, 86 billion neurons. And also around 85 billion non neurons. This is an important lesson from the account. When we talk about the brain, we are typically talking about neurons, but there are actually just as many non neurons in the head as there are neurons. What are all these non-neurons doing there? This is something neuroscience has very little idea about. Some neuroscientists are beginning to focus on this. There's a book called The Other Half of the Brain by a neuroscientist in Washington. He's talking about the non-neurons. Another interesting thing is the cerebral cortex, which is the pride and joy of our species, because no other species has such a complicated cerebral cortex. But the cerebral cortex only has about 16 billion neurons. That's a very, very small percentage of the sex. Where are most of the neurons? in the cerebellum. The cerebellum has close to 70 billion neurons. I thought the majority of neurons are actually in the cerebellum. So only half of the cells in the brain are neurons, and the cerebellum, not the cortex, has most of these. So, a lot of work, very intensive work is going on all over the, in all of the developing countries, US, China, UK, and so on. I'm just trying to understand these neurons by first giving them a typology, classifying them, first by shape, then by function, and also start into these non-neurons. We're really very, very much at the beginning of understanding the brain. And so there's a whole world to conquer for you young people. Hopefully by the time you get around my age, you'll know a lot more about the brain. And knowing more about the brain means knowing more about ourselves. Knowing more about ourselves means that maybe we can be better guests to our host Earth. Right now we're making a mess. One of the cartoons I showed you earlier shows the portraits from the chimpanzee up to the man sitting down at his, his, at his computer. And then there's another version that uh, uh, I hesitate to show because it's a little bit rude. It has this whole sequence of, of development. And then at the end, instead of a man typing on his PC, there's a man saying, stop! We fucked up, warning us we're not on the right path. And I think to know what the right path is, we have to know a lot more about ourselves, and to understand ourselves means to understand the brain. <laughs> well, a uh, couple of years back, I went to. Uh, did a series of lectures in Taiwan, and they made this picture. It's useful because they colored the various uh, lobes 
definitely making it easier to remember. So this is looking at the brain from the left side or right side. Left side. This big lobe here is called the frontal lobe. In many of these slides, I put both languages in because hopefully many of us will continue to work in an Asian country and we have to know the term, technical terminology used in China as well as used internationally. So this is the frontal lobe. Uh, remind me when it's on ball uh, or something. Okay. Behind the frontal lobe is the parietal lobe. Behind the parietal lobe is the occipital lobe. And in purple here it is the temporal lobe. And the cerebellum that we were talking about is this green part here, called Xiaonao. Rather than going with a very, very detailed diagram of the brain, I think we'll just use a simple diagram to mention some of the important sites of the brain. There's a sulcus. Everybody remembers sulcus now. That's where the cortex goes in. Very important sulcus. This is called the central sulcus. This is a very important landmark because in front of the central sulcus is the nausea area. Controlling movement throughout the body. And if we had a diagram of the, of the body along the motor area, we'll see that the body is upside down. The tongue, the lips, the head, the neck, and so on are down here. The legs, the feet, and so on are over there. It's upside down. So given that the lips, the tongue, the mouth, and so on, are over here. What do you think is this relation to speech? When you lose the ability to speak, first discovered by somebody called Broca, is this area that he noticed that was damaged. This is why it's called Broca's area. Behind the central sulcus is the counterpart. Instead of rotor, it's sensory. So we have the central sulcus. Again, the body is represented upside down. The other major sulcus, in addition to the central sulcus, is the lateral sulcus. And below the lateral sulcus, is the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe has two very important areas for linguists. An auditory area somewhere around here, and behind it, a vernicus area, which is very important for semantics. The occipital lobe is called visual area. I'm sure you come across these diagrams again and again these, these, very, these uh, four weeks. And this kind of preliminary exposure perhaps will help some of you. So very important uh, summary of some of the things that I just said can be seen from this diagram 
published by Norman Geschwind, who was a professor of neurology at Harvard University for many decades. His article is called Specialization of the Human Brain. And it's collected in a book that's been translated into Chinese called Yuyan Yongxian Fatan Yuyan Hua. So, Eshwin says, what does the brain do when we have to speak a hard word? So somebody says something, it bangs on your eardrums, that signal goes to your primary auditory area, which is right around here. Right around here. Right around here. You have to understand what's said to you. So the part of the brain that handles a lot of semantics kicks in. And that's called Wernicke's area. So somebody says, uh, flashlight. And the Wernicke area says, ah, he said flashlight. Now I have to repeat it. How do I repeat it? I have to get in touch with that portion of my, my brain, which is in charge of other movements of speech. To do that, there's a bundle of fibers connecting the two areas. It's called the arcuate fasciculus. It's arched. It's arched. And fasciculus just means it's a bundle. And this bundle of information goes to Broca's area, which activates the motor strip in front of the central sulcus in order to speak. Lasha. So this is a very rough idea of uh, how speech is possible. So we've seen the work of these three pioneers who studied language. Broca, who uh, in 1861 published the first paper relating language to the brain. <clears throat> Broca was a polymath. He was an expert in many fields. And uh, one day, a friend of his said, please see a patient for me. We don't know how to help him. And this man came in, and it turned out he could only say one syllable. The syllable spelled in French is C-A-N, something like thumb. So the literature called him Monsieur Thumb, Mr. Thumb. So, Roca helped him for a long time, trying to provide some kind of remedy that was not too helpful. It was a brain damage that uh, people didn't know how to deal with. A few months later, another friend recommended a patient. And this man spoke five words. So he's five times better than Monsieur Tan. And he knew how to say, thank you, goodbye, and so on. Thank you so much. After these two people died, Rolka did an autopsy on their brains. And he was very excited to see. And the site of injury is the same for these two patients. It's in the lower side of the frontal lobe in the right hemisphere. And he, this 1861 paper describes this. And people since that time call that area, Broca's area, and a type of aphasia, a type of language disorder that people have. 
from Ansaris. Very shortly after Golda made this important discovery, Wernicke did a very similar thing, but with the semantics of this area here. Wernicke's ability to understand often what you say and can speak very, very fluently. But what he says most of the time doesn't make sense. Many of the things that he says are not words. So a physiologist sometimes calls this type of output uh, jargon aphasia. It's like he's speaking his own language. But it has all of the rhythm, all the fluency of the of native language. And the third pioneer, Desjardins, uh, had a different type of experience. This patient came in, he was a very successful businessman uh, in his 50s and 60s, and uh, nothing seemed to be wrong, except when he woke up morning a few days ago, he could no longer read. Nothing wrong with his eyesight, if you give him an eye chart, he can tell you everything. But if you give him a letter, say uh, S, he cannot say S. He'll say, gee, that looks like a circle. If you give him a letter capital A, he said, it looks like a painter, it looks like a painter's easel. Nothing wrong with his eyesight. But somehow, connection of visual experiences to the language code has been started. And uh, this has been called dyslexia. Serious cases are called alexia. Mild cases we come across quite often. Uh, for instance, uh, when I was teaching large courses at Berkeley, quite often, you know, several hundred students, some students would come up and say, I'm mildly dyslexic, I cannot distinguish saw, S-A-W, and was, W-A-S, things like that. So such students very frequently request the help of somebody sitting beside them when they're taking stands, which is fine. But, uh, in this case, was extreme. No longer do. After this became known, various other forms of lack of reading ability surface, for instance, the inability to read musical scores. So Broca identified the spot which was damaged in his two patients, and uh, he identified this area as Broca's area. And he further, he was a very foresightful man who was very wise. He said, you know, we don't really know very much about the brain. I see this, this damage here, but I hate to cut into it. Because if I cut into it, the brain will be damaged, and later succession, later generations of scientists who will know a lot more than I do will be deprived of the chance of studying this phenomenon. So he took the brains and stored them in jars of formaldehyde in Paris. Hundred or so years later, a young friend of mine, in a Donkers, in fact, she took my course in biology of language at Berkeley. She learned about these brains, and she said, you know, now we have such more powerful techniques for imitating the brain. Now. Why don't I see if I can get access to, to those brains and run detailed imaging analysis? So Nina got in touch with the descendants of Paul Broca, got the jars out, 
in the Paris, uh, in the Paris Museum. And these are the two brains. So these, this is the two, these are both brains of Monsieur Le Bon or Monsieur Tan. Here is the left hemisphere. Here is the cerebellum. Here is the frontal lobe. And here is the lesion. And here the close up of the lesion. I should say that at the time that the broker was operating, Ernie was operating, there was a fan in medical circles and also in uh, society in general called phrenology, P-H-R-E-N-O-L-O-G-Y, phrenology. These people, some of them were doctors, believe that uh, even very abstract traits like courage, loyalty, deceitfulness, are stored in well-described, well-circumscribed areas of the brain. And since the brain is right under the skull, somebody who's very experienced can feel the skull say, ah, you're a very great man, or other things. This is what's called phrenology. There's, a, there's an ounce of truth in this, in that all of these properties are definitely featured in the brain. But of course, they're not that localized. So Broca, Bernica, Benjamin, these people were highly localized. Neither Broncos had an idea. But given the language is such an extremely complex behavior, it must involve many, many regions of the brain, not just this one little region. So Nina went and did extensive MR magnetic resonance imaging of both of these brains, lots and lots of sections, sagittal sections, coronal sections, axial sections, and so on. And reported this in detail in the journal Brain in 2007. <clears throat> I'll just read a small portion of it. Sagittal, axial, and coronal slices. Okay. So maybe not everybody is familiar with these words. Sagittal means cutting the head this way. So when you look at a phonetic stone showing the tongue making articulations, that's a mid sagittal section. So these are sagittal sections. Axial sections are sliced like this. We're all about sections. So with these three types of sections, fetch to the computer, fetch to the computer, the computer chain, reconstituted, we give you a 3D imaging of the brain. So these slices reveal lesions in the left inferior frontal gyrus, that's what Bronco said, deep inferior parietal lobe, and anterior superior temporal lobe. All of the lobes have good damage. In addition, there is extensive subcortical involvement. We didn't talk about all of the very important clusters of neurons subcortically, including the claustrum, putamen, globus pallidus, head of the floating nucleus, and so on and so forth. I think the lesson here is very simple. We must not overly localize. Certainly given the function, some portion of the brain is probably more importantly involved, other portion of the brain perhaps less so, but the whole brain is working like a total 
information processing unit. Of course, the great grew this to this complexity <coughs> through a lot of self editions. How did it start out? It started out very, very small. So when the mother's cell and the father's cell united to form you, it was extremely tiny, that one cell, having the DNA from father and from mother. 30 days, it's beginning to assume shape. 40 days. In 40 days, you can see certain provenances in the brain. So if we take this, and straighten it out, take this, and straighten it out. We see that it's actually a tube, and these three prominences correspond to what's called the whole brain, midbrain, and hindbrain. Each of these will elaborate into more and more complex uh, neural structures. By the time the brain is six months old, it takes essentially the overall shape of the adult brain. But notice it's actually still quite smooth. Smooth means that the cortex has not expanded to form the gyri and the sulci. So in English sometimes, you insult somebody by saying you're a smooth brain creature. This means that the brain is not yet fully developed. And gradually, in the remaining three months, develop all this critical appearance. But even by six months, <coughs> the auditory system is largely in place. This means that the fetus in mommy's tummy can actually hear language. Not language in the way that we hear it, airborne, but hear it in a very muffled way, low past. Only the low frequencies are heard. Nonetheless, it can hear a lot of mommy talk as well as sounds from outside. With ultrasound, we're able to look at some of the things that the baby's doing. So this baby is around six months, inside the baby, not inside the womb, and uh, I don't know how well you can see, but this picture actually shows, according to the authors, the baby the top right shows a baby sucking his finger. Babies come out sucking different fingers. My oldest child came out sucking his thumb. My second son sucked his two fingers. <laughs> the baby is all different. But they act as early. Uh, this one, thrusting the tongue out. Can everybody see the tongue? And this one, this is thrust to the side, this is thrust to the middle. This exercise, of course, is vitally important. When the baby's inside, it gets nourishment through the umbilical cord in the, in the mother's blood. But the moment it's born, the umbilical cord is cut, where is it going to get its food? From the nipple. But what if it doesn't know how to suck? 
for if the mus the muscles are holding the nipple, the labial muscles, the retraction of the tongue to complete the vacuum to suck. What if these mus these functions are not in place? The baby will die in a few hours. So this is extremely important. And it's also interesting that these movements are also centrally involved in speech. So here's a baby that's just born. And he's a psychologist called Andrew Belson at the University of Washington. Back in the 1970s, he went from hospital to hospital making faces at babies. So here's Meltzow sitting in front of him. Here's Meltzow opening his mouth. Here's Meltzow cursing his lips. No problem. Neonates, they are too old, imitating. That's another very, very important factor for language acquisition. You imitate. So the urge to learn, powered by the ability to imitate, is very, very important to our species. But recently, we found that it's important to other primates. Here you have a monkey facing somebody sitting on the sun, he sits on the sun. Another interesting aspect of neonates is that always under a cry. And a few years back, in 2009, some German investigators decided that babies with different native language backgrounds seem to cry differently. So here's the French part, French here's, if, if this is an idealized fish pattern, the baby cries like, ah, as opposed to a German baby who cries like, ah. Not every time, not every baby, but statistically significant. So, this is, in effect, on the feet is being made to the hearing to move. Once of hearing this type of possibility, this possibility is effect. In Mumbai's team, there was another woman called Jasmine Monke. She went on to extend these studies. So for instance, uh, she studied Mandarin's uh, uh, people and German speakers, as well as uh, an African language called Inso in West Africa. And her findings seem to suggest that Mandarin has a little bit more complex cry, because Mandarin is a tongue language, and tones compared to the fish And Inso is still more complex. Because according to the literature, Inso has nine tones. So this is all very, very intriguing, especially for us who are not speakers of tone languages and investigators of tone languages. So Professor Zhang Tsai Tsai has been in touch with Kathleen Wonke to see whether we can add to this data and to need data because Cantonese also had nine tongues. And uh, it should be something comparable to Insul, which has nine tongues. In any case, there's a lot of work done now, since the 1940s, on how languages are acquired from baby from uh, infancy. The early studies were done by a German with a bilingual child called Herbert Leopold. 
an important study was done by uh, Russian English, very eminent English called Roman Yakovson, in which he tried to compare child language with aphasia, with historical linguistics. But uh, over the several decades now, stimulated in part by an important book by Roger Brown at Harvard University called A First Language. Uh, a lot of experiments, a lot of observations, a lot of databases. And much of this is summarized in this very convenient table that Patricia Kuhl prepared. Patricia Kuhl is also a psychologist at the University of Washington. In fact, she's the wife of Andrew Nelson, who had to be a funny faces. Very nice scene. And the article is called Phonetic Learning as a Pathway to Language. In this table, you'll see that month by month, from birth to a year old, the various functions are specified for perception and for production. Perception, of course, precedes production because production must wait for adequate muscle control. So it tells you at what time the infants can discriminate. And it contrasts with all that movements. And at what time disability seems to be reduced since you know, needs to discriminate all contrasts. A good example is uh, uh, the true liquid concepts in English, R and L. Right? We have uh, L like uh, light and R and in light. But this distinction is not made in Japanese. Not meaning lots of languages. That means being one of them. For instance, in a Toyota that I uh, bought a long time ago, the glove compartment, where you put bass and so on, was not Grove compartment, Grove compartment. G R O V E instead of G L O V E because they don't distinguish the other one. But Japanese infants have no such problem. They hear L I distinctions as clearly as any other one. But over many, many months of not making use of that distinction, that ability to discriminate L and I gradually happens. It's not prepared to attend to that distinction involved. So, uh, <coughs> decline in foreign language as an exception around the Netherlands. Uh, another thing that uh, who includes in this table is kind of interesting. It's called statistical learning. As I speak, or speak to you here, you don't get this sensation that it's a stream of unbroken sound. But it is. You speak to an oscilloscope, you speak to a sonogram, and you'll see it's a continuous stream. So when an infant hears speech, it hears a stream. Somehow it has to segment it, it has to cut into it. Because only if you cut into it and pull a chunk out, they have the possibility of learning, oh, that chunk of sound means light. So segmenting is extremely important. How do you segment? Well, it turns out that uh, 
blind technique is by statistical learning. <coughs> Danny Safran <coughs> is a <coughs> psychologist <coughs> at the University of Wisconsin. She did this experiment with eight unbold infants uh, 20 years ago. <coughs> The infants were here. Bobi, Bobi, Rongola, Bobi, Daku, Madoti, and so on. A continuous stream for three or four minutes. After a, few after a few sessions of this, we found that the infants respond differently to, diff to different to different triplets of these symptoms. Who key role? Very often, for sure. Go, la, who. There you go. Pi, ro, is not a favorite chapter. Ko, ba, bu, bi, da is not. The infant has extracted out certain three syllables which go together. So these are very properly meaningful. These are candidate words. So in addition to invitation, there are all, all these other capabilities that the uh, infants have. So <coughs> you'd be born three months old, one year old, two years old, and so on. This is the chronology, and this is the weight of the brain. <clears throat> this is a famous diagram from a classic book called Biological Foundations of Language, uh, written by Eric Lennonberg. So the brain starts out three, four hundred grams. And over the first two years, whoa, it explosively grew to over a thousand grams. More than triple its weight in the first two years. This is part of the childhood that we talked about in an earlier slide. When, when an infant, when a child learns a tremendous amount of the local culture, By age two, various things have taken shape, and Eric Lindbergh feels that around here to around puberty, this is the age most important for learning language. So sometimes in the literature, you feel you find people talking about critical age. This is the so-called critical age for learning language. that he labeled the language acquisition. I think over the years since he showed this diagram and the variants of this diagram in several places in this big book, people oversimplify the critical period. Um, Earlier, I mentioned Roman Dacos, that he was a very, very eminent linguist. When I was a graduate student, I heard him come and give a lecture, and the host introduced him as, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to present to you Roman Dacos, 
the only linguist in the world who speaks 12 languages fluently, all in Russian. And when he starts talking, it sounds like Russian. But, Jacobson wrote in many languages. He wrote in German, he wrote in French, he wrote in Norwegian because he spent some time in Norway, and he wrote a lot in English. There's no foreign accent. Language is much more than the motor skills of producing a set of sounds. These motor skills certainly have a maturational schedule. It's the same type of maturational schedule as when you play the piano or when you swing a tennis racket. All of these things, when taught young, are much better perfected. Same with the mouth muscles, tongue muscles, soft palate muscles, or talking. But language is a lot more than that. Yeah. Language has words, words, lots and lots of words, grammar, and as a person becomes more and more mature, his language only improves uh, because uh, he's learned more words and uh, is more familiar with the nuances with which they use. Uh, but everything really comes to an end. And uh, beyond a certain age, the brain doesn't handle language as well anymore. Let's see where this will go. You probably don't recognize me. Uh, a couple of years ago, I went and uh, Dr. Manson Fong took an MRI of me, and this is what it looks like. So there would be 192 images scanned statically from one year to the other. Let's see whether I can make a little So it looks like I can. Looks like I can stop it any place. So here I show two MRIs. One that uh, Anson took of me, and one of Anson himself. As you saw, there are 192 frames. In this case, we stopped it at frame 87, frame 91, comparable frames in Sagittarius. A lot of detailed studies, of course, can be done. But even from these two diagrams, some things are quite clear. This is Anson's ventricle. 
ventricle is a sac in the middle of the brain, which holds cerebral spinal fluid. This is Manson's. This is mine. Manson's is about 5,000 cubic millimeters. Mine is almost seven times as long. What does this indicate? My brain is shrinking. These are people whose brains have shrunk also. Uh, the longest human lifespan is Jean Carmont. He lived 122 years. This is somebody that Chinese linguists would know, Zhou Yuquan. He's the one that uh, advocated the pinyin that we all use. He lived 111 years. And this is something that he wrote when he was 111 years old. So these people, as far as we can see, were still quite functional late in their lives. But not everybody is fortunately spared. This is a portrait of Alois Alzheimer. And in 1911, Alzheimer wrote, on certain peculiar diseases of old age. This was the patient that uh, Augusta Detta that he was carrying. And again, <coughs> using this uh, microscope, he noticed there are two very distinctive abnormalities in his brain cells. One calls tau tangles, and one called uh, beta amyloid plaques. Plaques are outside of brain cells, angles are within brain cells. This gives you a picture of Contrasting a healthy brain with an Alzheimer's brain. This is like the small ventricles that Anson had, and this is like the large ventricles. And now we know how the brain atrophies relative to its various regions. There's a region called entorhinal cortex that atrophies the most. The hippocampus also, and then the frontal lobe. The other lobes are relatively spared. But the ventricles, of course, uh, expand much beyond its normal size. I was doing mostly uh, historical linguistics for most of my scholarly career. <clears throat> and this made a huge impact on me. Alcorn was born in Shanghai in 1933. And I was born in Shanghai in 1933. And through our professional lives, we very often got together, chatted in Shanghai Nisa plans, and he was for a while chancellor of the Chinese University of Hong Kong. 
And here's a picture that we took in Hong Kong at the Chinese University. He was, of course, a great scientist, father of diagnostics. But by the time he was awarded in 2009 the Nobel Prize, he could not accept it. His wife, Gwen, had to go speak on his behalf. Many times I went to visit him. He lost control of any of the three languages that he was fluent in. So he had Alzheimer's disease. And uh, his doctor said <coughs> that the cow, <coughs> the beta amyloid, these things had been hurting his brain decades before he was clinically analyzed. So it's really important for us to understand what has happened to the brain as much as possible to prevent such decades of damage being done to the brain. So this paper by Jack in 2010 in Lancet is a very often quoted diagram of when you begin to have too much beta amyloid, too much tau, reduced brain structure, that by the time you report to the clinic to, to complain about the loss of brain functions, it's already much too late. Luckily, uh, experiments are being done to show what's happening with language in the elderly brain. For instance, in the young brain, there's a lot of hemispheric asymmetry. Each hemisphere in taking more of charge of some tasks and the others. In the old brain, hemispheric asymmetry is reduced. And here's an experiment showing the reduction in hemispheric asymmetry. And uh, Cabeza, who first noticed this, calls this the chiral on hemispheric asymmetry reduction. <coughs> Another difference between how elderly people process language and young people has been called the PASA bomb. This was noticed a decade ago called the posterior to anterior shift in aging. And PASA just stands for posterior to anterior shift in aging. Many of the tasks that the back of the brain performs in young people is shifted from. So there are all sorts of ways that as the brain atrophies, other portions of the brain take over to compensate for the loss. So it's crucial for us to know how much of our current knowledge, based on weird studies such as these, actually apply to Chinese studies. For instance, uh, <coughs> there is something called melodic intonation therapy that was first initiated in, in Boston. When a person loses his ability to speak, he becomes an aphasic. And these people 
and that if you teach these physics to sing first, and then gradually take away the melody, that non-melodious speech sometimes remains. This is a way of regain, helping them regain speech. Instead of saying, good morning, how are you today? You say, good morning, how are you? Like that, okay? In the melody, it makes the words more salient. After the aphasic recovers to some extent, removing the melody. Retaining some of the benefits. Now we saw earlier that infants cry may reflect tongue languages. We speak tongue languages. Pitch plays a more important role with us. Will it be true that melodic intonation therapy will work much better with speakers of tongue languages? We don't know. But it's a question that we cannot find answered in a weird literature. Questionnaires. Very often you go to a clinical exam. Uh, the doctor says, uh, I'll give you three minutes, name me as many words as you can that begin with the letter S. Doesn't make sense in the context of Chinese writing. You go to the shrine and say, Give me some words to be begin with the letter S. Yes. Yes. Doesn't make sense. All sorts of cultural and linguistic matters need to be studied from our own perspective. <laughs> There's a kind of a Bible like thing called. Uh, um, Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Can I say it right? DSM. It's used universally. It was developed in, in, in America. And it's now becoming used in China. And some members of our team went and looked at the Chinese translation. It's terrible. It looks like a Google translation. Nobody who reads Chinese will understand the Chinese translation of that DSM. And yet it's not to be used. This is my last slide. It's not, aging is not an isolated phenomenon. It's happening all over the world. And it's especially severe in China because of the many years of one child policy. And now, as this diagram shows, uh, the source is the United Nations. Okay? People 60 or over almost triple by the time we reach the middle of the century. This poses a tremendous financial burden on governments and a terrible psychological burden on families unless we can help all these people each well. To provide that help, to meet this challenge, we need to know how the brain works so that as people age, they can continue to function, be independent, and contribute to society. And we, who are the researchers after this, touch, this type of knowledge, will be contributing 
not only to science, the science, life science of brain, but also importantly to our own society. So I hope any of you will consider this seriously. Thank you. for a couple of questions. Any questions from the students? Anyone? Any sort of questions will do. <laughs> Asking for clarification, uh, out of your own curiosity, um, or more in-depth questions, all of them are welcome. Yeah, Professor Jacob. I always have a question. <laughs> so the, uh, at one study with uh, infants, where evidently the results showed that they were especially sensitive to trisyllabic counting, so could you provide more details about the language? Um, and it, it was just curious why, why Gave no details about the native language. Well, the person who initiated this kind of research was Jenny Safran, lady psychologist at the University of Wisconsin. And the language, of course, uh, has in Wisconsin with English. <laughs> uh, but it's been replicated in many of the laboratories, um, including the University of Rochester. Um, I think the particular language is not all that important. What is important is that the child, eight months old, can somehow keep track of these syllables as they go by. This was just listening to a, to a tape recording for three or four months, oh, 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 three or four minutes, and after a few sessions, they respond differently to the ones which are syllables, uh, in that sense, which call to frequently together, and not to those which do not uh, call to together frequently. So the stimuli, I mean, they, so you have ones where they in, right. uh, in were they equal? Like, Approximately equal, yeah. Monotone. No, no pitch pattern to help. The second thing was purely on a statistical basis. This is, this is only one of the studies. Patricia Cool says this type of statistical learning starts around seven months, and there being other types that uh, I haven't reviewed today. So the other question I had was the uh, expansion of the ventricles with aging. Um, could, could that be the cause of the, the hemisphere, the tendency then to consider symmetry of asymmetry? But one would think that it's just expanding symmetrically. And maybe it's the left versus the right, that would still hold. The expansion of ventricles <coughs> is a passive phenomenon. It didn't say, I want more space, give me more space. Rather, it's the loss of white matter and gray matter that initially kept it in. It's the atrophy of those gray and white matter that is more room for the ventricles to expand. But you raise an interesting question. You know, I wonder whether different shapes in the expansion could result in different type 
um, compensatory shifting uh, brain activities. I don't know whether that helped. Come on, don't be afraid. And um, since she's quite shy, <laughs> let me start with another question. Um, we are also waiting for the um, very informative um, lecture. And so we said you like a living as an encyclopedia to us. Um, so it is important to emphasize that the scientific literature so far has been heavily skewed towards the Anglo European contents, as you said. Um, and it's also important to enrich the literature by studying Chinese languages. So one question I've been thinking about is, if we were, I mean, as, um, as a researcher, um, uh, say, I mean, be able to speak these Chinese languages, um, if we were to communicate to this international research community, why is it interesting to study Chinese languages in the context of uh, cognitive neural, uh, neurological studies? I mean, what are the properties that could be particularly interesting? I mean, what are the properties of Chinese languages that could be particularly interesting? Uh, from a cognitive neural psychological perspective, what would be the possible answers that, apart from tones, that you mentioned, uh, that Chinese being a tone language? So, what are the other Typological properties of Chinese languages that could also be interesting in this context. Uh, the Chinese language has been reviled repeatedly in Western literature, um, beginning with 18th century literature on what the Chinese language is like. It's, simple. it's so simple, um, and instead of speaking it, they sing it, and they have no ways of indicating past, present, on and on, this type of uh, ethnocentric criticism, which do not hold water. So I think your question is right on the point. Let's stress what are some of the positive aspects. Positive aspect is that why do you need all this tens and aspect and number and so on? You get along perfectly fine without them. Right. Um, even the adjective we use sometimes are biased. We say Chinese as an impoverished topology. Why is it impoverished? It's simple. You don't have stuff that you don't need. Um, I think, in addition to some of the more conspicuous differences, the tone, the writing, these simple morphology, Chinese is very well worth studying because of the richness of its culture. Um, Sometimes we're brainwashed into thinking that when we say something, we go into our mental lexicon, pull out the words, pull out, put them into the right syntax, and lo and behold, a nice sentence comes out. I don't think it's like that at all. I think very often there are all sorts of bits and pieces, constructions in our heads. And depending on the context, I go in there and pull out a few of those construction and use them. This is very different from the generative view. One person that championed this view was a professor of the University of Harvard called Dwight Bollinger. He says, you know, it's not derivational. Very often it's memory. So uh, when I see Professor Lee King sitting there, and he's going to talk this afternoon. Uh, I should say something polite to him. I say, oh, Xiao Wu Bo Hui Qi Er Gong Tin. I'll wash my ears. This reflects an attitude. 
and it literally thousands and thousands of you see. Uh, I come here poorly prepared, but I'll tell you what I know in the hope of exchanging for your wisdom. I'll drain in you. I throw out bricks. I hope to get the jade back. So learning a language is much, much more than vowels and consonants and a few defensions and communications. Learning a language is hitting the key to a trader house of cultural entanglement. And Chinese is one of the few languages that has a very, very rich treasure house. So, for instance, Xie'er, Gongtie, Padrin, and Yu, these are all sisters. These sisters who have been accumulated for thousands of years. Some of them are very beautiful. And if you learn the right ones, they guide you to better, better conduct, better behavior. Yeah, I knew I'd take you this off. Thank you, Professor Wang, for this really wonderful uh, lecture. You uh, uh, took us to human evolution, uh, to language, to child language, to uh, aging, uh, from language to memory, you know, to uh, neuroscience. Um, in fact, as you were talking, I realized some of my slides this afternoon could be better modified. <laughs> so I was doing part of that. But uh, at one point, you mentioned uh, that the LCN can quickly or soon be uh, expanded to LCNG. And you uh, discussed one of the fascinating uh, studies by uh, this uh, uh, professor in. Uh, um, Chinese Academy, uh, uh, oh, yeah. uh, in their yeah. are analysis of the um, uh, the cave people uh, in uh, Kenya. Uh, did they do any study uh, uh, or analysis that indicated uh, the language capacity of those people in terms of? I'm, I'm, I had the fortune of visiting um, uh, Professor Samuel Fisher's lab just a couple of weeks ago, and I was totally uh, taken um, by the uh, um, ability in which they are able to uh, do genetic analysis and language disorders. So, uh, as you know, uh, Samuel Fisher was the person who uh, discovered FOXP2 as it relates to uh, human language disorders. So I'm just curious as one angle in which LCN could be extended to LCNG, whether people such as uh, Professor Fu, who came totally from a different angle uh, to study human evolution, whether there may be bridges that could be built to help us understand uh, language evolution and language disorder and, and therefore human language behavior. Thank you. Any comments and suggestions? Uh, that's a very important topic. <coughs> we talked about the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals actually had bigger brains than we do. They, they went extinct. Quite often, people from newspapers would call me and say, Professor Wong, did, did the Neanderthals have language? It's impossible to answer for now, of course, because looking at the skull, there's nothing left there that will tell you that they had language or did not have language. For a while, physical anthropologists would look at the depression inside the cranium and say, in our case, because of the left hemisphere, especially the lateral sulcus, is higher because of the bulkier then below, it probably means it had language. But this is this is really 
highly, highly speculative. On the other hand, as uh, Professor Lee was thinking at, if one day we get so good in extracting ancient DNA, we have the full Neanderthal DNA. Once we have the blueprint on how this man was made with the genetic information, we could, in turn, infer what kind of brain it actually had. How big was its temporal level? Did it have anything like brain material? And things like that. Then, in that case, gradually, way in the distant future, we may be able to answer questions of the linguistic ability of other species. But at the same time, we must be cautious not to oversimplify. Simon Fisher uh, was one of the people who contributed a lot to uh, a gene called FOXP2, which was discovered in a family in London. This London family had a very well-defined uh, lineage with three or four generations, all marked down. Some had this disorder, some did not have this disorder, and it was found. Um, the ones who had disordered KE, uh, on Fox 2 the family was called KE, by the way. The disordered ones had this kind of impairment. And the media got very excited about this, by this and said, ah, now we found the language gene. Ask you to is the language gene. This is other nonsense. We must be cautious in the same way as we were with Rokazeria. One of the lesion here doesn't mean that this is language. You hear a beautiful concerto and you pull out the plug, radio is silent. Doesn't mean that the radio is a concerto. So many things that we have to learn about how genes grow. But I'm really hopeful that in addition to language, cognition, neuroscience, brain, words, way back there is the genetic group that made all this possible. Okay. Once we reach that stage, it would be a very, very impressive species. I, I just add a note to what Professor Wang just said regarding the, OSPI, the relationship between OSPI2 and the language. Um, and the media, not only the media, so uh, wrongly or wrongly interpreted, but even linguists such as Chomsky and Bowork, when they write in the articles, they also uh, specifically point to OSPI2 as a language gene. And, this was an anecdote to this because a few years ago, when I was the editor of the journal Neuro Linguistics, there was a special issue in which Chomsky in the world wrote an article and uh, making this point. And then Simon Fisher actually wrote to me saying, that's totally wrong. He himself doesn't think that uh, Oxford is a language gene. It's just one of the genes that may be important or uh, in, uh, uh, that play an important role in determining or influencing. Uh, whether you have or not have language disorder. So uh, this is very important for, uh, for everybody, including the students, uh, to know that there is no one to one relationship between one gene and language behavior. Thank you. Maybe one minute for, yeah, great, one question, yeah. Thank you for the talk. I have a small question. Um, in the first um, the acquisition, the cross information and the pitch information were acquired so early. But for the second learn for the second learners, it, they were almost the most difficult part um, to be present, to be acquired, I think. Um, so my question is what's the possible reasons? 
for the early acquisition of Prosty and Peach acquisition. And but for the late acquisition for the second acquisition. Yeah, cross tier provision. There are probably several reasons why Prosigy has a special role uh, in language acquisition. Um, as I said earlier, the baby, the fetus inside, is hearing all the speech, but there's a lot of folks who do hear it at just the low frequencies. And if you take speech and filter out and say everything above uh, four five hundred hertz, which you do, which is the process. And it's very easy to learn at the beginning because it requires essentially just the arrangement control without needing to synchronize it to movements of the palate and the tongue and the jaw. So segmentals come much later. Especially segmentals like the liquid consonant L and R typically come very late in all languages. And uh, because it requires a type of fine control. L is called the lateral. Why is it called the lateral? Because the front path of the exiting air is blocked by the tongue tip. Then one side of the tongue is lower to allow the air to come out. This is hard, much harder than you can a pitch go higher or pitch go lower. One last question. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the lecture. I have a more detailed question. Um, as to the tone study, uh, you have mentioned that uh, the researchers uh, research the tone by baby crying features. So I wonder what is the age of those infants? I mean, um, if the infant's age is very early, does it indicate the possibility that the baby start um, studying tone from its uh, fetus stage? Um. I don't know very much about the subject matter in that. Uh, I hope you'll have a chance to approach Professor Tom who is following up on this one. I don't think our knowledge in this area has gotten very detailed, only very, very approximate. For instance, the initial study by Mountain reported the current biology, contrasted with German and French. It's well known, aside from sentence prosody, even word stress is quite different in these two languages. I'll take the word linguistics. In French, it's linguistique. Stresses on the last level. In German, is Schmach is a shock. Stress on the person. Lots of words like this. So the baby is hearing all this. And as we saw, babies have a tendency to imitate. So if there's these facade patterns, it's trying to imitate this facade pattern. That would be a very simple kind of way of looking at it. Professor John surely be able to speak much more directly about it. Okay. Uh, I think you can all agree with me that uh, Professor Wang's lecture is not how Zhuan Yi Yu, it's really how Yu Yi Yu, right? Throughout Jade, in anticipation, in anticipation for more Jade. Um, he has taken us through a great journey of the, both the um, biology and ontogeny of the human life covering many grounds. And also, uh, I think it carried down the, you know, the lecturing tradition studied by Professor Zhao Yuanlin, that is to deliver 
uh, intellectually rich and deep content in a very kind of vernacular way, a very intelligible, easy to understand way. So, so for that, I think Professor Wang's lecture has uh, set a great um, beginning for the whole summer school program. So please join me in thanking Professor Wang again for his great lecture.